Okay, folks. That's pretty good stuff, right? Where is it? See that? So I'm Jeff Edgers from the Washington Post. And now I'm going to do the thing that I do every week that creates total anxiety inside my soul, which is I'm going to find our amazing guest for the week. In this case, it is the incredible Annie Lennox. So uh, this, you, as you know, this always takes uh, a minute, and but it will work. I know it. I believe in it because it's always worked. Um, let's find her. There she is. Oh, just a piece of cake. I see her out there. We're waiting. We're waiting. She's coming. Trust me. Believe. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Let's see. Annie, I can see you. I've invited you. It says it's waiting for you. I think you just have to accept my invitation and come on board. It was almost too easy. It was like 30 seconds. I've had these take nine minutes, seven minutes. Um, but I know she's going to be here. I know it. I assume your Wi-Fi is strong enough in your home to make this work. Well, she's gone. Okay, we're going to go get her back again. I know we can do it. There she is. Let's try one more time. Okay. It's connecting. Yes! Hi! Oh, the stress, the stress. It's not that bad it. for you. It's, it's, it's actually much worse for me because I am on the thing and everybody's like, Annie Lennox, where is she? And they just see this, this guy with the bad I'm haircut. I'm so sorry. You know? I was so stressed out. <sighs> You know, Instagram is I'm not, it's not a, um, it, Instagram is not an, uh, I don't know if I should say this, we're on Instagram, but it's not really a perfect medium. It's as good as it can be. As good but, as it can get. Yeah. It, hey, hey, isn't that the mantra these days? As, as good, good as, as you as can get. get. Why yep. not? As good as you can get. Um, Here we go. But hey, we made it. How long did I have to make you wait? It was really not that, I'm not that sweaty. I mean, it's a little hot today, but I was like 60 seconds. But so the record was actually... The record, weirdly enough, was David Byrne, who you would think was some techno... Really media savvy. ...whiz guy. And it was, I think it was seven minutes. And I even showed, I went out and started showing pictures of my backyard because I, I didn't know what else to do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Um, hey, well, thank you for... the new normal, huh? I'm so glad that you, you came on to talk with me because I've been watching... First of all, I mean, like all of Earth, I'm a big admirer of you as an artist and, uh, you know, your whole view of the world. But also I've been watching what I feel like is a slow and helpful move on to communicate with us on your on your social media. It, it, at first, you uh, For I'm a guessing, Luddite, it's not bad. It, no, no, it's it's great. And um, yeah, you, originally, I think you did you intend to do that or did it just emerge somehow? Which bit? You mean just like coming out on Instagram slowly? Well, you've been doing, if you go to your, I mean, yes. for us, we're, we're seeing you, you give us little updates all yes. the time and yes. messages, yes. but also you right. played, you played here, here, here comes the rain again in this yeah. beautiful, yeah. majestic Thank way you. in your piano. So you've been doing a lot. I have actually. And yes, it was conscious because, um, you know, what do you do? Um, on a lockdown situation, let's say. It sounds like such a cliche now to say lockdown. Um, but we are at home here are still intending to stay locked down. I'm, mm. I'm 65, so I don't wanna expose myself to risk and the virus hasn't gone away, even though we're not talking about it as much. The risk is still the same thing. So for me, I, I, I'm at the stage where I can actually, you know, I, I can create, and I am terrified of technology. I always have been, ironically. <clears throat> but I have a piano, and I have a room, and when I can get 
peace and quiet because there's so much going on outside with drilling and hammer and ma major noise and it's not like a studio you know it isn't like that this is it this is it it's just yeah. a little room and me and an iphone <laughs> and i'm sort of going like this <laughs> you know what i mean it's crazy and i t do so many takes because i want it to be i wanted it to be good and i thought what can i do and that that was it it's just like i have the songs I could try this. And then I started to perform and I started to think, wow, you know, touring has always been uh, stressful for me. Um, people know that if they follow me, they know that I'm used to tour. It was my life for a couple of decades. And then I had my children and it was kind of like, I want to be a mother and I want to be an artist. And women will understand that kind of multitasking that one has to do. And so now I'm like here uh, at 65 with the pandemic and a piano and an and who, it, iPhone. And it's possible. And I go, oh, yeah. And I got someone to bring me. I said, oh, God, what do I need? What do I need? I need to, a tripod and a little light just to kind of soften the look because the, hmm. the look is, you know, <laughs> I don't have makeup. I don't have <laughs> hair. It's just me. I got one of the... Annie, I got one of these. Yeah, you ever seen one of these? Oh yeah, no, I have one too. Yeah, got one of those. That's true. Well, that makes a difference, that's really. I have a lot of trouble because I, first of all, I've never used makeup, but also I have this thing where the hair, because I don't want to. Um, your hair looks beautiful. My hair, I just don't want to go out to get a haircut. I've I've been going out once in a while for things, right. but I feel like, do I want to risk it? to yeah. get a haircut. No, I do not. Do no. I want to, you know what I mean? And so- Yes, I do. But this I, was a, actually, I, because, <laughs> you know, I've been known for short hair over the decades. So I had the, the foresight to, uh, to get a, a razor, you know, what do you call it? An electric shaver. Yeah. And, I, and I had a go myself and I looked like it, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. So my husband, I said, I said, please, could you give me, could you help me, please? So he did this and it's time for another shave. So I think maybe we'll go for the full, the full buzz cut. I don't know. Yeah. And I, and I, I said, I, what, I, why did I, I have all afford, these hairdressers? I can't afford what you, if, if you mess up, it's okay. Cause you look like Annie Lennox. If I mess up, it's, it's me. So it's not, it's not going to be good. Um, no, I, no, 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 hang on a minute. I still look like me. It's, I'm me. It's funny, isn't it? Because there's, it's so interesting. There is that concept of a person that's out there with a name, but there's a person behind it too. And that's really interesting for me. It's like a double, a double act, you know, Annie Lennox. Yeah. Oh, that's me, Annie Lennox, that's somebody else. I find it much, um, I don't know if you do as well, but so I don't want to bring us down, but you know, this week was a hard week. And- You think? I got- You yeah. think? I got to Tuesday and we normally do this thing on Tuesday and Friday. And I was like, you know what? I just I can't do it. And even today, yeah. as I got up, I was yeah. like, mm. Mm. and I got I up know. and I shaved and I put on a little tie. Yeah, you look so smart. And I feel much better. But yes, that's um, true. That's true. It's a little bit of a battle. And I'm just wondering if you're finding psychically, if it's helpful yeah. to know that people are out there watching you and that they want to see you and they want to hear your, your ideas and your music at a moment like this, because it could be very easy to isolate too much almost. Well, it's been a beautiful thing actually, because to be, to be honest, um, this sense of isolation, it can be paralyzing. And when I think about like, who am I, what do I do in this world? What, what can I do? And then there was this notion of like, actually I have all these songs and I've never, some of them I haven't performed for years. And it was like I went into the store cupboard. I wrote about this, about it being feeling like going to a store cupboard where everything was covered in dust. And I kind of pulled things out, took them down to their bare essentials, which is just a voice and a piano. No fancy production, just the songs. And then the other thing was, I realized that the songs are so melancholy. The songs address existential crisis. And it's something that I have felt all my life. I think that we, right now, we're living in unprecedented times, okay, to be really serious about it. And as a young teenager, I carried that angst, that feeling of the world not being right. And I come from the northeast of Scotland, a little town, well, it was a, it's a city, but it's a small town in a way, it, you know, and right up there, which is slightly removed from things. But, you know, I was, 
I, when I look back, I realize a sensitive girl thinking about the world, thinking about inequity, thinking about injustice, I was, it was resonating with me all the time. And this is the theme, this is the narrative, this is the thread through so many songs that I have written. They're songs of grief. I've been grieving, in fact, for the state of the world ever since I woke up. Then, in the early 1970s, I woke up and said, this is, this is hard, I'm carrying pain. There are so many wounds that need to be healed. So a lot of the songs deal, deal with that kind of disparity, that tension between uh, beauty, longing for beauty, but still pain. And it's what we all experience as human beings. We're all here on the planet. And you know, so there's this incredible sort of uh, racial, racial activist, uh, and she's a white woman. And she said, we're just one race, the human race. And we're, it's, it's expressed in different colors. But what we have to realize we have to understand as white skinned people is that people of color have been suffering for de uh, not just decades, for centuries, and it's never been put right. And the moments that came here in this country and in all around the world were missed. The opportunities were not taken up. And so the cancerous situation just remained fairly well ignored, marginalized, so the, the irony is the pandemic has exposed the inequities to such a degree. So at the same time, someone takes with the iPhone, the one that I'm using with you right now, you know, this tool that we have, the one that I use to record that everybody uses because it's portable, that instrument, if you like, technological instrument, filmed the actual killing of a man, a black man, George Floyd, in the street of Minnesota, bam, there it is. That is evidence. So this is all happening at the same time. COVID-19 is taking place and young people are coming out, a diverse selection, everybody coming in the streets with masks, without masks, protesting. They're risking their, their health. They're risking their lives to say no more to racist, systemic racist uh, abuse. Um, sorry, I'm going to just talk and talk and talk because I'm on a, I'm a roll now. No, it's, you know. it's a good, it's, it, everything you're saying makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, so you kind of observe this and feeling the new generation have woken up. Here they are. And, you know, it isn't just black folk that are fighting for their own freedom and, you know, uh, rights. It's a, a whole mix of people. But my absolute concern is that, you know, the media are interested in sound bites, short bites, whatever's happening, whatever's hottest. So COVID pandemic goes to one side, racist inequity quite rightly comes up to the front. But then where is the long traction? Where, where, when, where, when do black lives really matter in a really good way where we share common ground, where everyone says, that's right, let's address it. Let's, let's clean it out. Let's really try and do something. This is something I've been feeling for decades. As a, I'm an older, white-skinned woman, mm. and I've seen and, ex and seen and witnessed racial injustice and felt the pain of it, tried to see how can I make a contribution? What can I do? And at the end of the day, people have to work together. You know, I find it very hard, as, a, 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 as you can tell, as a, as a white man, and I'm 49, but I find it very hard to know where my place is other than generally shutting up. Uh, I don't feel like, I, I almost feel, I, I felt the same way during the Me Too movement. I felt like I could not really speak in any intelligent way about it because I had no idea what it was like going to work and having someone leer at me or treat me differently right. because of my gender. So I just didn't feel like there was a place. But then you also, on the flip side, feel helpless because you want to help and you want to do something good and you see how bad things are out there. These Every day I pick up, uh, you know, our, I go to our newspaper and I look on, on Twitter and I can't believe how many uh, people are being hit at, at protests and, you know, this person in a wheelchair getting knocked down, this other person just standing there with their hands. You know, I don't know, uh, I don't know how you actually 
resolve that in any way because it would seem to me at a moment like this, the police and everyone involved would know, hey, we're on film. Everything we do is being watched and they're still in many cases emboldened to do such a thing, you know? It's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's hard when you, I don't like to watch the news much, but nowadays it seems that I've gone to watch news because it's just, everything's kicking off from one moment to the next. But to, you're quite right. To see this hardcore abuse, it reminds me of the 60s, the riots that, you know, all the things that took place back in the day. When you see a police officer with a hard baton coming down on, on, a, on a person who's a girl, a woman, a, unarmed, peaceful protester, it's just appalling. I'm, just, I'm getting the images in my mind that I've seen on a replay and it's just like, no, this is wrong. And I think there are enough people in the country who have been outraged by it. And every single major city in this country, for all those nights of protests, people came out and they came out and there were peaceful protests. And unfortunately, the trap, a kind of tragedy that I, th I think on my, my perspective is that the looting actually that takes the attention away from the peace, peaceful, pro righteous, peaceful protest. And it actually eclipses the issue that the peaceful protest is trying to express, is trying to share. And I asked myself, all right, how do you change minds? How do you change hearts? How do you change attitudes? How do you change racist bigotry? How do you change that? How do you change systemic, uh, systemic um, racist practice? How do you change that? You shame it. First of all, it's shamed, you know. I don't think if, if George, and it's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. If, if this a killing of George Floyd had not been recorded, it would go down in history. It would just be like that. There are so many, so many people that have been killed. And now it's like enough, but only because people have seen the evidence. If they hadn't seen it, it wouldn't have happened. And white people like me that haven't really lived in America, you know, for very long, I've only been here for a little while, we're shocked. And black yeah. people are saying, what do you mean you're shocked? This happens to us every day. We live this. And that's the mm -hmm. aha moment. That's the kind of little bit. So that could be the bridge. It's the same thing with the feminist movement. I say that men are welcome to the feminist movement and men must be allies and must be feminists too. And you're saying, I don't know how to do it. And so I think the dialogue, uh, the thinking, the insights and the sharing of these views as we are doing now starts to maybe change the zeitgeist I hope, I hope, I know how long these things have taken. And it's, it's like, uh, like the glaci glacially slow. They describe change for the feminist movement as being glacially slow. And the glaciers are melting. And so we've got climate change as well, by the way. So I think we're just, we're in a crisis. I definitely brought us, uh, no question, I brought us down. Uh, but no, it's not done. It's true. We it's have true. to, we, no, this is not. Of course it's down, but the thing is, what do you do with down? I mean, you, what do you do? Do you go and sort of just hide in, in a garret or do you, do you speak about it? Do you take action? Do you look for other people that feel the same way? I certainly can tell you, even talking to you now, and I know this is a Washington Post interview, but I'm talking to you as a person because we're sitting in our own little boxes, you know, discussing something one-to-one, -one, person to person. And it feels good, that feels good to me. And I'm amazed at how people are able to, sh to shift. I mean, you know what? In the LGBTQ world, things have changed so much. I've witnessed them just over the decades. When I was a teenager in, 19, in the early 1970s, nobody was gay. There was no gay, you know, there was no gay in the village. Now it's, it's a much better place. Not everywhere. Yeah, I mean, much, it was much it was probably, better. you know, I, I, and I don't know what the cultural marker is, but for me, when I was maybe 15 or 16, I remember when Rock Hudson uh, was revealed to have, yes. have been gay. Suddenly that oh, changed God. the world quite a bit, but still you had Freddie who didn't, w wasn't comfortable, you know, socially wow. with it. But today, was, here we are, it, you, can, yeah. you can be gay 
uh, and you can succeed in entertainment and you can be part of, right? It's changed. It really has changed. So I think we have to, you know, we can have some hope. And Nelson Mandela's quote, hope over despair, it's like a mantra sometimes in my head. It's very simple. Hope over despair. It's binary. I get so despair and I can tell you that I'm the queen of despair sometimes. <laughs> I really truly am because I feel it. Why? Because I'm, an, I'm empathetic. You know, it's not, when you're bigoted, you shut everything out. It's like, oh no, this is my turf and that's your turf. It's us and them. I don't want there to be us and them. We need to kind of understand empathy is the bridge between us and them of understanding. See, my God, let me just think, what would it be like to walk in your shoes? Wouldn't you want to be treated the same way as every, and I say everyone else at all, like a white person is treated. We don't even know the privileges living in the skin color has when you compare it. I feel safe-ish going out in the street in my jet. Well, that's, that's all relative, I know. But when I think about myself, if I, if I can transport myself into becoming a young black man stepping out in the neighborhood that I live in, would I feel safe? You know, if I had a hoodie on, would I be a target for institutionalized racism where the guns just boom, you, that's it. And not just one shot, like multiple shots, you're dead. I mean, that's what it's like. That's what it's like here. That's what it's like being like here in this gun culture. And it's like, oh, it is a wake up call. It's a massive wake up call. We have a lot of wake up calls going on, whether it be racism, pandemic, gender injustice, all of these things boil down to human rights. And right now we're talking about race and it's and rather than just talking about it, we need to turn it into action, you know. Um, you do, Annie, I'm just going to, uh, uh, because you did talk about turning into action, because you've been very active in charities, and I know you're going to launch something. I don't exactly know how it's going to work, but you're going to launch this. It's a COVID-19 sort yes. of mission with your charity, yes. which is The yes. Circle. Yes, it's cool. And um, uh, you're going, it, and it looks like what you're centering on is uh, what women and girls are going through as a result of this. But can you explain just a little bit about what that'll be and also yes. how people can sort of do something? You know, in a way, it's a small initiative. It's, it's, it's very difficult to scale up when you are a not-for-profit organization. And, you know, suddenly every, every charitable, charitable organization in the world is having to respond to the challenges that have been multiplied by 10. If you can imagine, just let's just take one issue which is domestic violence against women. And they're in a lockdown situation with a violent partner. I mean, you know, the calls went up by 70%. Yeah. So that's the pandemic of violence, uh, you know, or it's, it's a strange thing that, uh, well, I, there's so much to talk about with that. Um, I think I, I, you know, there's so much to talk about. I kind of run out. <laughs> you know, we're gonna run out of steam. But you're gonna you're gonna launch that in like another. Yes, very something. soon there'll yeah. be a launch of it. It's just an initiative. It's just a fundraising uh, initiative with various artists who have so so kindly agreed to do uh, performances for people just to try to raise some money. It's really just to try to be supportive of women and girls in various projects. And you know the need is so great. So I, I think I'm feeling like this at the moment because. I just think the need is so great and that even uh, not-for-profit institutions or organizations can't even begin to cover it. Actually, I think the change needs to come from attitudes, systems, po politics, everything. I mean, it's like the whole world needs to change. And the challenge is, how do we do that? Well, can I, so can I, uh... I'm going to ask you a couple questions. So I'm not a professional, as you can tell. I write stuff down and never go on. You're camera, not a professional? But, no, I mean, I'm a professional writer, but I don't do this stuff. I mean, I started doing this because I... Um, what stuff? I, what do you mean stuff? Like this Instagram show. Like ah, I never, right. Because no. I normally, I, I write stories. We talked once because I was writing a story on Aretha Franklin. Um, and, and what I do is I write articles. But when this happened and I was shut down here in this barn, yeah. I was like, how can I... That's right. Do something that'll be useful right. for what I do, a small thing. And so I thought, well, why don't we launch this thing where we'll just have conversations with people who we think Perfect. are interesting. That's, that's it. And that's what we've been doing. And I thought, boy, Annie Lennox, you know that. So 
I want to ask you, can I ask you a few random questions that are, that are to me interesting? By, by all means, by all so, means. So first of all, I was showing my son, he's 10 years old, he loves Queen, and I was showing him the, a clip. I'm going to show you a picture because I found it. Uh, I was showing him this clip. Remember that thing? No, I have, I have no memory. That is 1992 <laughs> when, you, when you sang Under Pressure yeah. with David Bowie yes. at the Freddie Mercury Tribute. Um, and uh, I'm sure you remember that. And I, I, I wondered if you could talk to me just briefly. I, I guess you weren't really friends with Freddie Mercury. You met him once. But um, tell us anything you could about that experience and also singing that song with David Bowie. It's an incredible performance. Yeah, I think it is an incredible performance. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm stunned every time I look back on it. It was a moment. It was such a, you can't, what do you say about that? It was rehearsing with David Bowie. And I mean, I, I, I don't like the word fan, but when it came to a boy, I, I'm like a super fan. And I was so awed by him and his presence. And so to rehearse with him and, ha and feel that I'm, it's like, I'm not worthy, that was my feeling. But I really thought uh, very long and hard about how I could m help to make that duet. It's a hard song to sing. Under Pressure is a really tough song to sing and to sing it with David <laughs> Why is, that a hard, why is that a hard song? We think of because your voice as perfect. What it, what it makes, why is that song hard for you to sing? I wouldn't well, think it would from be, a, you're amazing. From a, from a vocalist perspective, it depends obviously which part you have to sing because there, you know, a duet is two parts and I was given a, a particular part that I had to learn. And the words are kind of, they're not easy to, to remember always. And you come in, you know, from at a really high, in a, in a note that's hard, to, what is called pitching, you have to kind of throw in the high note. You don't know if you're going to land. It's a little bit like, you know, it's like an arrow that has to aim for that bullseye. It's got to, yeah. it's got to hit. So there was a lot of things to be scared of. And I felt like a warrior. I felt like an Amazon. It's a crazy thing to say, but you know, the mental pictures that you put through your head, it's hard to describe when you're a performer, you become your alter ego, you step into it, you know, so you have to be very bold. And the whole day I waited in the dressing room for this performance that was later on in the early evening. I sat in the dressing room waiting, waiting, waiting. And there was a lot of stuff going on all around. And I just knew this has to be exceptional. And it's not, was not only for me, it's a moment, you know, the whole, the whole context of, HIV and AIDS, that was something you couldn't even say. And here was Freddie Mercury who died from AIDS and he died in probably, there's a lot of shame associated with it and a lot of silence and stigma. And so here are people coming out and saying HIV and AIDS is a, pro is a huge problem and we have the chance to celebrate his life but to contextualize it and say, there's no shame in having HIV, is it? It's part of the messaging. and. What can I tell you? You know, I, I, I'm glad the cameras were rolling and I'm glad that they caught that moment. And uh, I don't go back very often to, to watch, you know, things that I've done, but that was a, a rare and special moment. And the bullseye was hit. You, you say, you, you talk about being, uh, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, being, uh, finding it hard to perform live and, and being, you know, almost nervous, I guess. But, almost. You know, when, I mean, when, when we you watch know. it, when we watch you perform yes. live, you seem so completely in control right. and so self-confident. And um, it, it, is it like you're off to the side and when you're about to go on, a, you know, the switch flips or what yes. happens exactly? Yes, well, I mean, it's all a person. It's a really funny internal battle with your own fears. And so the fears come up Every performer I know, with very few exceptions, will, will know what, what this is about. The fears arise and you're facing your, you know, your fear, which is, there it is. And can you subsume it enough? Can you overcome it enough? Can it go quiet enough, the, the chatter, the fear chatter in your head, in order to say, well, why are you doing this? <laughs> there must be a good reason why you're doing this. So it has, you have to almost, I think, in a way, I mean, I used to have a visualize myself almost like a boxer. And it was like, you know, you're fighting your fear and of the audience, the audience is out there and they expect something. And it's like, whoa, I don't think many people can imagine if they haven't stepped on stage to perform, mostly they'll think, I can't imagine myself doing that. 
Mm. It's like, I can't imagine myself doing a bungee jump or c coming out of, a, of, of, a, of an aeroplane with a with, with the thing, you know, what's it called, a parachute. Yeah. I can't I have a certain fear. I'm quite a fearful person. <laughs> and then I sort of have this courage when you when you, you do these things, um, uh, you recently perform because I've been watching all these home performances people are doing. But you recently performed "Beautiful Child" with uh, Dave Stewart, you know the yeah. rhythmic song. Obviously, um, is that hard to do when you're? Pl I don't understand how that works. You're someone's playing somewhere else. Yes. I guess you have headphones in. But how, yes. tell me about that process. And did it take a lot of work, or did you have to do it multiple no. times? Or it was. I mean, you know, like the technical things. Are done. There's a few little technical things. Dave is a long, long way away from me, and I'm, yeah, I'm where I am. And using, I mean, using this, what I'm pointing to, this iPhone. God, iPhone must be. Is I feel like I'm promoting them. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, iPhone. And where's my free one? I, I, I would just suggest to people to seek out that appearance, that that performance. And also, you know, in April you did "Here Comes the Rain" again, and. Um, I, I mean, the way that you did that song, it made me think what we could use is an entire record of you performing your own songs, just you and a piano. Yes. I have you been know? thinking about that. I, th I think it would be a lovely thing to do. It's, it's like, a, if, it, if it happens, yeah, I don't quite know. You see, here's the deal. I think everybody's waking up not quite knowing what's happening from one day to the next, you know. Mm. How, how safely can we do this? So it's... Um, it's a very, it's, a, it's an opportunity living in this time for many people just to simply try to be in the now, you know, because you're not able to, what the things you took for granted, the freedom that you took for granted to go out in the street and to have, to maybe go to a restaurant or a cafe or whatever it was to interact with your human kind. It's no, it's no longer, well, it's coming out, but it's dangerous now. I really believe so because, um, you know, we're, we're acting like it's magical thinking, like, oh, it's, it's fine now. It's just, everybody says consensually, it's kind of fine now. And the pandemic isn't so much in the new abilities, but it's not as much. And I'm, I'm afraid the second wave will hit. And, you know, I'm just conscious of that. And so I'm just working within parameters. And I'm trying to find my, my balance. But I can tell you that it's been like this for me. I've had moments when I've just, the energy has gone. I, you, can you, I, I'm sure you can relate to this. I know exactly you what you mean. Is it, you know, it's weird. It feels unbearable. For the last few days with this crisis, which in a way I welcome, because I welcome that voice of protest that says no to racism, no to racism, no to systemic racism i welcome it but at the same time there is this terrible grief of realizing really understanding if you have that sensibility you are filled with grief and a feeling of paralysis that you described earlier and it le has left me personally my brain has been spinning all my friends all the people that i know sending sending information books to read uh, links to black lives matter everything it's like yeah I, I need i thought that i got it i thought i would i had been an ally and actually i realized there's so much more to do and what can i do at this stage in my life can i still use my platform to be an ally for justice you know for, I, I, we are against injustice and we are we are all, we all need to talk in a unified voice. And these barriers that, of skin are, are so ridiculous, but they, but they exist. And we- I've been we, watching, I, I'll tell you, Annie, I've been watching, um, it's been very comforting because someone just, I, I sometimes read the scrolls of the comments and someone said, you, get, you should get some, some uh, 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 black people talking on here instead of you two, uh, which it's true. I'm not gonna say we're not uh, white, but, um, I've been watching on Instagram and it's amazing how many conversations I'm seeing that I can peek in on. I mean, the other night I saw LL Cool J and Ice-T just were talking for like an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been tuning into Questlove does this um, amazing DJ thing every night. He does it for like two yeah. hours or three hours where he's just playing whatever and he makes comments in, in between it. And in some ways it's democratizing a little bit of how the media works. Um, you know, True. we try to, I don't think people realize it, but we try to get a diverse group of people to talk with us. And uh, 
it's hard. I mean, it's, it's just hard. Sometimes people aren't available and sometimes they have right. other mediums they, they want to go to. I mean, I would love to have, to have LL Cool J or um, well, dude, you're gonna come have on to, here. Well, you said it now. I mean, you, then you must, you've said it and then you have to pursue this. You have to pursue, I think you have an opportunity to use this platform in, in such a creative, uh, powerful way. And that if you reached out to people eventually, you've got to keep knocking on that door. Oh my God, you yeah. don't understand. I'm sure you I've will. Sent maybe, I've sent maybe 10 requests over, because sometimes the 11th request works. I've asked LL yeah. Cool J's people like 10 times. We are going to have Ava DuVernay, who's an incredible figure, uh, director, just incredible figure on here. And I have had people, I mean, Tiffany Haddish and, and uh, Daryl McDaniels, who I love, um, have come on here. We have Dan Rather, whatever. So we're, we're doing our best. You know, I covered one, um, I, I've only covered one thing since uh, Out of My Barn, since it started. They had a concert in New Hampshire. And they did? They, they did? Uh, yeah, it's a place called the Tupelo Music Hall. Mm -hmm. And um, it's normally an 800 seat venue. They have people like Buddy Guy or Lyle Lovett play there. And what they did is they built a stage outside and they painted numbers on parking spaces. Oh, and that's for, right. Yeah. And for $75, you could, you could, um, you got a space and then you got a second space where you could put your chairs mm -hmm. and for food, you ordered it all online and they had a <laughs> golf cart and it drove it to you. The problem is there are only 75 people there. So it's like the, the economy isn't, so that could work. So if you I'm double laughing. That, you know, I mean, look, I'm, I'm laughing, but it's extremely serious. You have millions of people unemployed. I almost can't bear to think about it. I mean, we are in such peril, to, yeah. to be quite frank. And I kind of have a, a, a um, what would I say, a, a ring around my thought process. It kind of goes so far. And then I can't, I can't think any more about it because I can't do any more about it. And it, then that reduces me to the despair bit that I was re referring to earlier so i kind of just have to keep the positive stay with the positive and try to do the best i can and I'm, i'll be honest with you uh with this platform that you are sharing and giving me an opportunity to to, to speak on where i express my view and i can talk and say something about solidarity with the black lives matter movement and with um everyone but and, and my kind of earnest hope like you that that it won't just split off into us and them again, and that it, there will be some bridge, some common, and I saw it, I saw it in the demonstrations, and that was something that gave me hope. I, I saw people of all colors and coming out on the street. I don't know, when you watched it, I don't know if that, you kind of went, oh wow, it isn't just one color here, it's mixed. Well, you see, I mean, I think what I've seen is, um, I've seen terrible moments where I say, I can't believe that's happening. Yes. And then you see these moments, you know, there was a one moment where uh, a young black protester was about to have the police move in on him and uh, a white uh, woman moved between the police and him as like, a, to, to kind yeah. of protect him. You know, that was, that was quite moving. I also saw a great one that, uh, great in that, I just love that this happened. It was some white kid with a skateboard was about to smash a window at a, at a place. And I saw a young black man walk in and grab his skateboard and say, don't do that. You know, mm -hmm. because um, I think this looting thing really clouds the matter. And I don't think- Yes, that, exactly. And, and you know, ultimately we're talking about tens of thousands of hundreds, all these people out there protesting peacefully. And yet we're seeing sometimes that, um, you know, five people running into a Macy's in New York City that's is right. on the news. So yeah, that's right. Um, that's it's, right. A, it's all out there. It's, that's it's all out there. It's, it's all out there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Can we take, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click it. There's a thing on here where you can ask questions and I've got a bunch of questions here. I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes these questions are so dumb, I don't even read them out loud. Let's, let's leave those ones out. But, uh, but let me see if there's an actual, like, useful question here. So, um, Let's see. Uh, um, resources to meditation courses, counseling. Do you do that? Do you meditate? No, I, I, I wish I, I could. That's something that has been like, you need to meditate all my life. But I'm a restless person, so I haven't really gotten down to the meditation. I think music, making music is about as close as I'll ever get to meditating. But maybe one day I'll manage to get there. This person, multiple people just say they love you. Um, oh. Other people say, what is the interviewer's name? I'm Jeff Edgers. I'm the National Arts Reporter. 
uh, at the at the Washington Post. Um, Hi, are you going to sing? No, you're not going to sing because you're like a perfectionist. You're going to you're going to if you want to see any sing. Uh, well, there are many ways. Well, I can't close this question thing. Sorry. Um, there we go. If you want to see any sing, just go to her Instagram because she has like. I have uh, a few. Though. There's a few things on Instagram, but there's a th few things on YouTube. There's a there's a lot of stuff just floating around <laughs> in the ether. It's happened. There's a lot of stuff over quite a few decades. You know, you can see how people age. You can see I brought out. I have my record here. I'm going to show you. I have this 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 record. Yeah, let just show me part one. of my. Yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. Now that was in the seventies. What's the now song? Have you been? Um, I don't know about you, but I listen to some songs now, and I just suddenly feel incredibly connected to those songs and sad. Yeah, and, of course, and, there's nostalgia in it. You know, I was listening to this. I don't even know if you like him or not, but Warren Zevon. I was listening to that record, and there was a song called Desperados Under the Eaves, and it's just about, like, a sad guy in a motel in California. That's what I would say. And suddenly feels crushing to, yes. to listen to that in a way it didn't a few months ago. And I don't know if you, do you listen to, do you find it <laughs> healing or helpful to listen to music you love right now or no? I, I, it's, it's a strange thing. People ask me this quite frequently. What are you listening to? And um, <clears throat> I don't really listen to music. It's a strange thing to say and I can't explain. I can't justify it. It's, it's something like when you said it's crushing, music's very powerful. And to me, I have a ju uh, This is going to sound off. off mm, don't know what this is going to sound like. I have a jukebox in my head. Uh, there are so many songs floating around in my head. And I'm a performer, so I make music. And I don't really, I kind of stopped listening at a certain point. I just used to kind of listen to um, like a Tibetan, <laughs> Tibetan bell, sort of just those singular tone, you know, of one <laughs> Tibetan bowl. Yeah. I was like, that's where I want to be. That's, I just want to, I want peaceful. Don't want to, you know. You don't have a, um, so for example, we when we talked, it was about Aretha Franklin and you loved Aretha Franklin. Yes. You grew up yeah. listening to her. You don't ever feel a nostalgic urge to go take, get on and listen to, um, you know, an Aretha Franklin song, no? Or I, guess, I guess if someone put it on and I would go, I'd go, yeah, I love that song, but I don't actually. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I know it's really bizarre. It's weird. Maybe it is because day, music uh, is, I mean, that's how you grew up, I assume, and found yourself inspired, listening yeah, to I, music all the time, right? Yes, but it was so, so different. Again, it's like this minimalistic thing. I come from, a, a, I would say, this sounds a bit old fashioned to say I'm from a working class background. I'm from a working class background, but I am from a working class background in Scotland that really identify with that. So it was a time when there was very li little. We were not impoverished. I, I, I've seen what poverty really is. But you know, we, we had, my father had to work in the shipyards to make sure the rent was paid, the food was on the table. So, I mean, we did have a television, black and white, when I was a kid. And I think I had a little, little transistor radio. And at that time we listened to what we call Radio One and it would play the top 20. So there was a lot of music going on in, from that transistor radio and what I saw on television. So it was very, you know, it was very low fi And I've always just been that way. It's just like, I don't really care. I don't really care about the latest, whatever it is. I don't really care about it, except this, this, um, this has been so useful. And it's weird because I only have one of these and I carry it around and it comes everywhere with me. And I know it's not good for you to have it at the bedside, but it's kind of there. And it, and it does, it's such a multitasker and everybody has one. It's like, this is the, this is the time that we live in. And, and we, you know, when artificial intelligence finally, it, it, well, it's, I'm sure it's already here and I'm sure lots of people that are watching this know a great deal about it, but it terrifies me. Cause I think that's, then we're into the, the next phase, you know. And I'm really terrified about, um, when I think about global warming and how quickly we're heading for it. And then I'm like, well, it's, it kind of feels, I don't know how you reverse the systems that we've, I mean, it's, it's taken a pandemic, let's face it, to stop the entire world. I mean, the people that could afford it are like myself, flying here, there, everywhere. Everybody took flying for granted, cheap flights. But you course. know what's amazing, and, and again, I don't want to be negative, but what's amazing is it actually took until like tens of thousands of people were dying 
for us to be willing to completely change our behavior and stop doing what we were doing, which is just functioning. And even then, there are still a large number of people who are like, this isn't really real, or like, let's just, we don't need to do this. Um, and so when you look at something like global warming or, you know, just the entire issue, it's hard for me to see how it, we can look at this and say, oh, this is an example of how change is happening and we're gonna be okay. I feel like you almost would need to see the earth melting in front of our eyes. This, what would still, it take? For and there would still be people who would say, eh, it's you know, right. cool off, Discipline. don't worry. Deniers, yeah, I know. I mean, this is a perfect example. It has to, I always thought, you know, if things have to change, they have to, have to be systemic. You have to, you have to make the whole system change. And the whole globe is totally invested in the corporate world. And I, I cannot justify the corporate world in any way. I don't, I've always kind of hated it, to be honest with you. I've, I've loathed it. But at the same time, I'm one of the consumers. This is the dilemma that we face. And you can try to do, you know, good consumption. You can try to be conscious of things. But in a way, we're kind of caught. I mean, I, I, again, you said, I'm sorry if I don't, you don't want it to, to be to sound despairing, but this is the dilemma that we all face. I mean, let's face it, we're, we're just all consumers. We're caught in it, we're enmeshed. We have to have Leonardo DiCaprio come on and he can talk about what he does and how he, <laughs> he's <laughs> transformed his life. It's so interesting, isn't it? My God. I mean, what do we do? Do we go out and become, um, what's that word, when you have to live in the land and you just have survivalists? Are we all going to be survivalists? I mean, are we all going to wear hazmat suits <laughs> to go to a restaurant? I mean, it's, you can't swear on the Washington Post. Fucking serious. This is so serious. You, saw, you just did swear. I wait, kind of did. You did. No, we'll kind of that. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, wait, someone else asked a question. Uh, they asked if you're going to write a memoir. Uh, Who cares? No, you'll Who never cares? do this, no? What do you mean? We care. Why? I don't know about the memoir. It would be so interesting. My memoir would be the memoir of memoirs. Let me tell you, I've lived so many different lives. In my life, in my life, in my time, I've been, when I stop to think about it, it's, an, it's you couldn't make this up. You couldn't make this life that I've yeah. lived up. And I'm continuing to live up. You, can't, you couldn't make it up. You know, there are, some, there are some really good memoirs. There are some terrible ones, yes. But I know that if you really put your mind to it, you personally, you personally, you would write one of the good ones, one of the great ones, I believe. I, well, there's a lot of expectation out there, so I don't really know. I'm just taking it one step at a time. And I, my memoir, eh, eh, I don't know. Have you read any good memoirs that you've, uh, do you read them or no? Not so much. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know what anybody, my life is really interesting. I don't know if I can explain my life to you. And right now it's a little bit unusual as well, but it's been a lot of just, kind of getting through the days and you know I'm, I've got my laptop that are uh, here yeah. ta -da, yeah. ta -da, the one. there it is it's like this is this is Annie Central right here with all the in, incoming emails and things that I have to sort of respond to and I think a lot of people feel that they're, they've been on a treadmill and this is our kind of western consumeristic life is this treadmill of I'm super busy super busy and I, I don't want to be that person. I kind of want to slow it down. But, you know, it's hard. I don't, I'm sure you can uh, identify with that, the feeling of, like, catch up, catch up, catch up. Well, I feel like, I feel like I, I'm home all the time now, but I've never been, my schedule's been, never been more complicated. It seems like it's exhausting, mm, right. you know? I think it's because I'm also consuming a lot. But I'll tell you, my last pitch for your memoir, I didn't actually have the question, but someone else did. But... I don't think, I'm sure you understand it when you think about it intellectually, but I was, you know, 13 years old when you, when Sweet Dreams came out and um, the image of you and that, the sound of that song and everything that you did from that point that we knew you in popular culture was really revolutionary, unlike mm -hmm. anybody else. And mm -hmm. being able to tell that story in your own voice would be incredible to me, you know, because I, I sit there with my daughter who's 18 and I show her Annie Lennox and I say, oh, look, this is, you know, because we forget so easily what revolutionized our world. And I would, was, that's why I would love it. You know, kids, to, think, you know, it's not, yeah. sorry. Well, just to say about Sweet Dreams, it's very interesting. This is a song that 
D Dave and I wrote in, I think, 1982. And that's a long time ago now. And this song has just been a thread. It's just continued on through the decades in various kind of ways because people have done remixes and different versions of it. But it's still fresh because I think it was a, a visionary statement of its time. And it's um, the thing about, I think, Eurythmics music is that there was always a, a kind of surre surrealistic existential twist uh, in, in the lyrical content. And also in some of the, the way that we presented ourselves, we were shapeshifters. We didn't belong. We were outsiders. We didn't belong to a group that's, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in a rock band, I'm a heavy metal band, in a genre somewhere. We didn't really belong anywhere. We were just like, this is, the, this is our, what we're doing. So we had the pop, kind of pop platform, but it was subversive at the same time. And our humor between Dave and I, when we were together, is, um, and particularly Dave, is really kind of, kind of you, uh, you have to get it. It's like a lot of twists in it. And this is English, British humor is, is like that. It's, it, there's a lot of nuance and subtlety and double entendre in it. So, you know, I think from an American perspective, sometimes that was maybe hard to get. It, it did have these funny little twisted references and metaphors and symbols in it. So Sweet Dreams is really the world we're living in right now. You know, I think when you put that and you see the globe spinning in the corporate boardroom, it's like, wow, we're at this level now. Here's nature. Nature is coming in, in the form of a cow walking in a boardroom. And it's like, oh my God, how do we coexist? And it makes you think about industrial farming and the food that we eat and how horrible how the slaughter, mass slaughter of, of cattle, you know, we can't, we're kind of, we're so disconnected from the food that we eat and the, the kind of processes that the animal, those animals have to go through. It's everything, the animals, the plants, the, everything we eat, it's like, we're just disconnected from it all. We're just provided as consumers. Yeah, we'll have plenty yeah. of that, more of that. And now we're at the standstill. And I think it does give us a moment to pause and to be more introspective. But you know what? When the doors are open wide, it'll be business as usual, just with, with a twist. And the next pandemic that comes, and I'm sorry to say this, but I know, I know for sure there'll be another pandemic, it'll be worse. And it's a horrible thing to say. <laughs> I hate to say this, but it's kind of true. I could cry and laugh at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel that way as well. Hey, look, you should, um, you don't have to do this, but maybe do Sweet Dreams on your piano later and uh, dedicate it to me and put it on the thing so we can see it. Because I want to hear that song again. That is, uh, you know, you can't imagine when you're 13 years old and that comes on MTV and we've got like Quiet Riot and um, I don't even know what was on at that time, but it just was so, I didn't know any of the things you're telling me right now because I was a 13 year old boy right. and didn't know oh, anything. But I knew I... watching it that it was from another planet. Another and I couldn't planet. understand what that planet was, but I wanted to know about it. You know, yeah. it wasn't punk rock, it wasn't hair metal, it wasn't pop, it was everything and not, it yes. was hard to, hard to figure out. Um, it was, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I have to tell you- An existential part, statement. It was an existential statement, it truly was. To feel, I, I wanna just feel, because we have to wind down because the thing about Instagram yes. is, if you don't stop before an hour, it disappears forever and we don't want oh, that. Oh God almighty. Um, but let push. me tell you, I, I wanna say that I think, I've seen how I've operated in my own life, I've seen my family, my children, people around, I do feel like there has been some level of change from going through this COVID-19. I feel like we have learned more about conserving and appreciating what we have and the connections we have with people and that sitting in a chair across the street and talking to somebody is okay. And um, there's something to that. We've definitely slowed down in a way. And I hope that some some kind of element of good will come out of so much pain and, and sadness, you know? Eloquently put, I feel exactly the same way, to be quite frank. And I mean, the future is at stake. The future is seriously at stake. And, and this country needs uh, leadership, good leadership with good values. And, and the whole political system needs to rethink its... its uh, uh, I have to stop there because I'm going to stop at the hours. I can't talk politics on the Washington Post. That's, 
that's going into a whole other realm. You can. We're, we're so lucky to have had you here. Um, so I hope that this isn't our last conversation. I hope we'll talk again. I've enjoyed time. talking to you. Wouldn't I that, really enjoyed talking really... to you. And I will, I'll be watching uh, your, uh, your Instagram. And I'll be uh, looking forward to when you talk to me. Because you're only talking okay. to us. And uh, talking That's to me fun. and also playing. And, nice. um, and I, I, I hope next time we'll see each other in person sometime, OK? Wouldn't, it seems like a long way, way away. It's, people are saying that now. I hope next time we see each other in person. Yeah, well, it feels like forever since I went anywhere, but I used to go everywhere. And um, but it's um, I know it's going to change. I know we're going to we're going to get out there. Again. Yeah, it will. It will change. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, all right. Hey, thank you. OK, thank you. Peace. Thank you so much. All right. Peace I will talk to you later. Bye. Peace Bye. and love. Bye.